Utah only has one amusement park, but it's most certainly a good one. The park is none other than Lagoon. It is one of the country's largest independently owned theme parks, and it also happens to be one of the most unique. This park is a deep ride lineup including some classic attractions, and some coasters they even built in-house. Not many coaster enthusiasts find their way to Utah, but this park should be on everyone's bucket list. It's one of America's most underrated parks. I'll explain why in this review. This park is shockingly old. The park's roots go all the way back to 1886, and it's the oldest operating theme park west of the Mississippi River. For the park's first decade of operation, it was known as Lake Park. It wasn't much of an amusement park, rather, it was a scenic lakeside resort. After the 1895 season, the owner of the Salt Lake and Ogden Railroad line moved the park three miles east of Farmington, Utah, and reopened it as Lagoon. The name was derived from the body of water in the center of the park, and it has stuck ever since. The park started adding amusement rides in the 1900s. Two of their oldest rides that still remain to this day are the historic Herschel Spillman merry-go-round that was added in 1906, and the blandly named roller coaster. The latter is a 1921 wood coaster designed by John Miller. While the park thrived in the 1920s and 1930s, the park struggled in the 1940s after World War II forced the park to close for three seasons. It became run down and the owners nearly demolished the park. But Robert E. Freed formed the Utah Amusement Corporation and leased the park. A big fire in 1953 almost doomed the park, but Freed persevered and now the park is better than ever. His family now owns the park and it's operated by his sons. The park now boasts one of the largest ride lineups in the United States. You can find 55 rides, including 11 roller coasters. That's an astounding figure for any park, especially an independent one. And that's not all. The park also has a water park, an authentic pioneer village, and picnic groves galore. The easiest way to access this park is by car. It's 20 minutes north of Salt Lake City. It'll cost you $20 to park there. Alternatively, you can get to this park with public transit. It's roughly a 45-minute bus ride to and from downtown Salt Lake City. Buses drop you off roughly a 10-minute walk from the park. The last bus typically leaves around 10.30 p.m., but check the UTA schedule for full details. Lagoon makes one heck of a first impression when you arrive. It has one of the most striking skylines of any amusement park. You have a series of large coasters extending into the parking lot. Then behind them is a mountainous backdrop. It looks like one of those fake parks you'd make on Planet Coaster, but this place is very real. It is one of the best settings of any park in my opinion. You will have to pay a hefty price to enter the park though. Day tickets cost roughly $90 to $100 per day as of 2023. This makes it one of the most expensive parks in the country. I think the only parks costing more are the big ones in Southern California and Central Florida. Lagoon does offer a $10 to $20 discount on day passes if you stay at their campground next door. Toddlers under the age of 2 can enter the park for free, but they will have to pay to ride anything. The park charges $0.50 cents per ticket, and each ride costs 4 to 10 tickets. The pay per ride option is not available for anyone else. Everyone else must pay that pricey day ticket. The most economical way to visit the park is to purchase a season pass. I know I would if I lived anywhere near the park. They pay for themselves after just two visits. Once inside, it's hard not to fall in love with this park. It has such a charm to it. The front half has that classic amusement park vibe. A few rides have some light theming too. Typically, it consists of signage and thematic paint jobs. Their newer attractions have improved in this department though. This includes the newer coasters and even the flat rides placed in the kitty area. But this more or less feels like a traditional amusement park. And that's fine because it's in pristine condition. The park is clean, and rides sport fresh coats of paint. The front half of the park crams attractions in every nook and cranny, so there's a ton of energy walking down the midway. The back half has a distinctly different vibe to it. It feels a lot more laid back. It's a nice breather from the hustle and bustle of the section with all the amusement rides. You have a scenic pathway along the lake, and better views of those aforementioned mountains. With the removal of the log flume, the only ride back there now is Rattlesnake Rapids. It is well worth experiencing, but unless you know it there, it's extremely easy to miss because you cannot see it until you're right on top of it. Then you have the super unique Pioneer Village as well. 
This is a recreation of a western town with all sorts of shops and theme displays. Make sure to save some time to stroll through this area. The displays are more akin to something you'd expect at a place like Colonial Williamsburg, not an amusement park smack dab in Utah. Then many people use this section to have picnics. Lagoon is one of the larger parks to allow guests to bring in food, so people take full advantage of this. You have plenty of picnic tables and grassy areas available. If you plan to buy food at this park, your go-to spot should be the beer garden. This is a German-inspired restaurant. The food here is amazing. It is so good that the park will open this venue up even when the park is closed. I haven't been too impressed with the other food offerings across the park in terms of quality. You have an Arby's and a Subway, plus the usual amusement park fare. Now let's talk about this park's operations. This is one of their biggest strengths. Few parks can consistently get trains out as quickly as Lagoon. The operations remind me of Knobles. And it's not just like there's one coaster like this. Every single ride sends trains out faster than their counterparts at other parks. Stacking is a rare occurrence in their coasters. You are far more likely to see a train block checked on the lift hill because the crew sent a train out before the prior one clears the final brakes. There are a few rides that have low throughputs, but that's because of the design of the ride, not the fault of the employees. But any coaster operating with multiple trains will look like a well-oiled machine as trains are dispatched like clockwork. The employees aren't just efficient, but they're super friendly too. Finding this balance is difficult. Lagoon is clearly doing something right training their employees both from a work and morale perspective. I hope that never changes. Now if you're a single rider, there are three things you need to be aware of. One, multiple rides outright ban single riders. The most notable is the Jetstar 2 roller coaster. While you can try to find another single rider, it is super awkward because you need to sit in each other's laps. You also cannot ride alone in Rattlesnake Rapids or the park's massive ferris wheel but those ones are easier to get paired up on. Two, for many years, this park banned single riders in the very front and back rows of any of their coasters. I believe this traces back to an incident in 1989 where a teenage girl stood up on roller coaster and fell to her death. This policy was thankfully relaxed in all their coasters post-COVID, except for roller coaster. Three, Cannibal and Wicked both have single rider lines. These were far more helpful when I visited the park back in 2018. At that time, you could access the single rider lines directly from the midway, so these were major time savers. Now, you need to wait through a majority of the queue line to reach them, so they maybe save 5-10 to 10 minutes max now. It's almost better just to wait in the standard line so you can keep your group together and also pick the seat you want. There are two other important operational notes. First, most coasters do not allow loose articles to be stored on the ride platform, but don't worry, when this happens, the park offers complimentary lockers by the ride entrance. This shows the park is doing this purely to maximize throughput and safety. It's not a cash grab like some parks. Second, the queue lines for almost every single ride are comically short. Most rides can accommodate just 10 to 15 minutes worth of people. So expect these to be filled entirely even on quiet days. And if you visit on a busy day, the lines will stretch way out onto the midway. For example, Last year when I rode Cannibal, the line went all the way back around the corner to the paratrooper. Yet, this took just 45-ish minutes, which is not bad for a park's signature ride on a very busy day. It just looked way worse than it really was. I've heard the park does this to add energy to the midway, but it does cause two issues. One, it can be a bit confusing to find the end of a line when this happens, especially because you have multiple rides in close proximity whose queues are all spilling onto the midway. Two, it can make the midways cramped and difficult to navigate on busier days. Again, the lines move fast as a whole, but the setup is a stark contrast to what you see at other parks. I have only visited this park on weekends during Frightmares, the park's Halloween event. From what I've heard, this is one of their busiest times of year. Yet, I've had no trouble riding plenty of rides. This is mainly due to the operations, but you can knock a ton out early in the day with a smart touring plan. It is worth noting this park does not offer a skip the line pass for the rides, so everyone is on even footing. You absolutely want a full day here though. That's even with the park having long hours, they are routinely open until 9 or 10 p.m. in the summer months. You want to have an entire day because of the quantity and quality of the rides, there is so much to do here. I recommend arriving at least a half hour early. This is for two reasons. One, 
the park opens the gates a half hour before the posted opening time, and they usually have the Terror Ride Dark Ride open for the day. This can easily get a 30 to 45 minute wait on a busy day, so it's nice knocking this ride out with a minimal wait during what's essentially bonus time. Two, when the park officially opens, you can head straight to the coasters to beat the crowds. Where you start depends if you want and need every single coaster credit. If you want to experience all 11 coasters, make a beeline to bat. This is the park's lowest capacity coaster by far. It's the only non kitty coaster to run with just one train, and I've heard it can get weights approaching an hour. I think it's a really bad coaster, but it does draw a crowd. I usually go right first. You have a cluster of coasters in close proximity to each other. I recommend hitting Spider and Wild Mouse first because of the lower capacities. Then you should do Wicked next. These three rides can get half hour plus waits on a busy day. I would then hit Colossus and Roller Coaster. I haven't had to wait more than 10-15 to 15 minutes for either of these rides even on a busy day. Their capacities and operations are just that good, but you might as well do it while you're over there. You probably will encounter lines by the time you reach the other side of the park, but this approach at least allows you to start your day off strong. The other two rides that can get 30-45 to 45 minute waits on a busy day include the Cannibal Roller Coaster and Rocket Drop Towers. I also suspect Primordial will get lengthy waits as well. This is the park's new for 2023 roller coaster. While we do not know what its throughput will be, it likely will be a smart one hit early given the crowds new attractions can draw. Now let's move on to the ride lineup. One unique thing I haven't touched on yet is Lagoon now designs and builds their coasters in house. Their vice president of engineering is Dal Freeman, who previously was the director of engineering for aerodynamics from 1986 through the 1990s. Freeman previously worked on rides like Cedar Point's Magnum XL 200, so he is more than qualified to do so. The first Coaster Lagoon designed themselves was Wicked, the 2007 vertical launch coaster. The park designed the ride, but outsourced the fabrication to Zier. After Wicked was delayed due to 90% of the support columns having defective weldments, Lagoon decided they'd handle the manufacturing of their next coasters as well. In 2011, the park designed, sourced, and built Bombora themselves, and was a resounding success. It's a super smooth family coaster with all sorts of bells and whistles like onboard audio and fancy lighting. Then, in 2015, Lagoon built Cannibal. This would have been an ambitious project for any full-time manufacturer, let alone a park in Utah. It would be the tallest and fastest coaster in the state, it would have hyper heights of 208 feet or 63 meters tall, while reaching speeds of 70 miles per hour or 110 kilometers per hour. And it opened with the steepest drop in America at 116 degrees. It still holds the record for the world's tallest beyond vertical drop, and it ended up being one of the smoothest and most rewritable coasters out there. Now in 2023, the park is unveiling Primordial. Lagoon hasn't revealed too much about this ride, but it appears to be a highly themed family coaster taking place in and around a giant mountain. It looks like something you'd get at a Disney park, and I cannot wait to hear how this ride turns out. This will take Lagoon's coaster lineup to the next level by giving them a story coaster you typically only get at a larger chain park. Of their current 10 roller coasters, their offerings are extremely well balanced. A third of their lineup caters to thrill seekers, a third of their lineup caters more to families, and a third of their lineup focuses on kids. Starting with the thrills, Cannibal is the park's premier attraction. I already talked about this coaster's daunting stats, but it's an incredible ride too. The first drop is world class. It starts with a powerful burst of ejector airtime before morphing into floater airtime that seems to last forever. Then the four inversions are great too. The Immelman hits you with strong G's. The dive loop is a powerful pop of airtime and the Lagoon Roll has some of the best hang time of any coaster. Then the finale has some theming as well as you wrap around these giant rock structures. See my review for more, but this is the main reason a coaster enthusiast will want to get themselves out to Utah. Wicked is a very unique launch coaster. The ride starts off with one of my favorite launches out there. The vertical LSM launch is a bizarre sensation. You are forcefully pinned to your seat as the ride works to overcome gravity. Then the first half is equally as awesome. The top has some strong ejector airtime, the speed hill that follows has some floater, and the zero G roll floats you out of your seat for several seconds. Unfortunately, this ride has a terrible finale. It's not rough or anything, 
but it's slow and uneventful. I talk about that more in a separate review. Colossus the Fire Dragon is a classic Schwarzkopf double looper. This ride started its life in the German fair circuit, but it has been thrilling guests at Lagoon for four decades. As I noted in a review, the layout is simple but effective. You have a drop, two vertical loops, and two helixes. That is it. While this ride doesn't have any airtime, it does extremely well in the positive G and lateral department. Those two loops are gray out moments for me. Then the helixes offer some more sustained Gs, just not nearly as intense. Then the transitions offer abrupt jolts of laterals, particularly the exit out of the second loop. Among locals, the most beloved coaster may be Roller Coaster. This is the 100 plus year old wood coaster that juts out into the parking lot. It's a basic double out and back layout, but has several spots of airtime. Most are moderate pops of airtime, but the entrances and exits of the turnarounds give shockingly good airtime on the ends of the train. And because of the huge renovation from Great Coasters International a few years ago, this coaster is running like a dream. I talk about that more in a separate review as well. Spider is one of the most well-known Mauer spinning coasters. This has the highly popular SC2000 layout, but this one is notorious for spinning more than the others. For one, it starts spinning immediately off the lift hill. Usually these rides don't spin until the first turnaround. Two, this one can spin like a top if you have an off-balanced car. This one does have quite a bit of braking, but it's a great option if you're a fan of spinning rides. Wild Mouse is another Mauer creation. This is a standard steel Wild Mouse plopped down the same spot where the park used to have a classic wooden Wild Mouse. The first half has great laterals. The second half does have some braking, but you may still get a pop of airtime or two. And you have a fun themed tunnel towards the end. Jetstar 2 is the envy of single riders. As I noted earlier, you need a partner to ride. And it's sort of awkward riding in the lap of another rider unless you're a couple, but the layout is fun at least. The big drops have some good zip to them, then the low turns are fast and forceful. The higher sections do meander a bit, but I think that's fair for a family coaster. Bombora is another great family coaster. This one rides like a Mach Young Star Coaster or a Vacoma Roller Skater. The helixes have a smidge of force to them, but the highlights are the glass smooth ride experience and the tropical onboard audio. The one coaster I genuinely hate at this park is the Bat. This is a Vacoma Jr. suspended coaster with bulky over the shoulder restraints. I find it to be a very uncomfortable experience full of headbanging. Not only is this ride pretty bad, but it also tends to have the longest line in the park. I would advise skipping it entirely, especially because the park has much better family coasters that you can get on in a fraction of the time. Huff the Little Fire Dragon is the kitty coaster. I think the name is cute, giving it some synergy with the big Schwarzkopf looper. This Seer creation is a basic oval layout, but it's perfect for kids. And if you're an adult seeking the credit, go for it. You're allowed to ride even without a kid. On that note, Lagoon is one of the best parks I've ever seen for kids. They have one of the largest kitty sections ever. You have this long strip of land in the center of the park. It has a ton of shade, and it packs in nearly two dozen kitty and family rides. Some are exclusively for kids, while others can comfortably accommodate adults as well and some are pretty darn unique. Children could easily spend hours here bouncing from ride to ride. When people point out the top kitty areas, they almost always mention some of the plant snoopy areas at the Cedar Fair parks, but this one deserves way more recognition for the sheer size of it. Moving on to the flat rides for older guests, this is another area where Lagoon shines. Their offerings are deep. You have all the standard spinning rides you could ever want, including some classics. Then there are some standout flats I want to highlight. The best of the bunch is Flying Aces. This is a classic set of Bish Roko flying scooters. They are just as fast, and the operators are more relaxed about snapping. So you can get some genuinely terrifying rides as your tub unnaturally jerks through the air. If you do this, it is the scariest ride at the park. The most intense ride here is Samurai. This is one of the few Mondial top scans in America. If you're unfamiliar with this type of ride, you have an arm with gondolas arranged in a star pattern. The arm and gondolas both rotate in a circle, and the ladder can flip as well. You get sustained laterals throughout, and some wild inversions. Some are slower and chock full of hang time. Others fling you through the air, giving air time or more disorienting flips. 
There are two other great options if you love going head over heels. One is Air Race. This Zamperla flat rides a series of slow and disorienting inversions giving solid hang time. Two is Rocco Plane. This is an older ride from Ierly. It's basically a ferris wheel where riders can rock the vehicle. You can even fully invert it. The key is to use the clutch. This gives you the power to stall your vehicle upside down. You can strategically release it to get a faster flip as well. I wish this ride more comfortable restraints, but I'm glad Lagoon has kept this ride around. You would also think Cliffhanger would be a good option for inversions. This is a top spin after all. I am used to the Huss versions that chain a series of quick flips in a row, but Cliffhanger was a big disappointment. This one stalled us upside down once, but that's it. The rest of the ride was just some slow and awkward rocking while hearing these grinding noises. The water effects were off for my rides because it was fall, but they typically have these on in summer. One highly underrated flat is Boomerang. You wouldn't think it based off the name, but this is the park set of bumper cars. These ones are from Elay, and they have some great power to them. You can cause some jarring collisions, and you have a big arena to do so. Rocket is a fun SNS drop tower. This one stands 20 stories tall, so it offers some fantastic views of the surrounding mountains. One side shoots you up, and another shoots you down. I've only done the latter, but the drop is decent. Other manufacturers make wilder drop towers, but this one still gives a solid pop of airtime at the start. Then you have some upcharge attractions in the X Venture area. You have a sizable sky coaster, a slingshot named Catapult, and the Double Thunder go karts. Moving on to the dark rides, Lagoon has two older ones that are still quite good. Terror Ride is the better of the two. The ride got an extensive refurbishment a few years ago, and the scenes are all high quality. You have some creative jump scares coming from all directions. Some really got me. The only downside with this attraction is that it's extremely short, like a minute in duration. But it's about quality over quantity with this ride. Dracula's Castle is a much bigger show building, so you have a longer ride. The animatronics and figures aren't quite top tier, but they do move and are timed properly. I would love to see this one get a refresh like Terror Ride to unlock the full potential. The park also has some notable observation rides. There are three I want to highlight. One is Sky Ride. This is a scenic way to go from one side of the park to the other. Two is Skyscraper. This is an enormous 15 story tall ferris wheel. This is the best way to take in the surrounding views. Three is the Wild Kingdom Train. This is a unique one. It starts off as a scenic loop around the lake, but then it goes past some animal exhibits. You have some rare animals here like camels, zebras, and even tigers. Fair warning though, the enclosures are super small and the park has been subject to criticism for this in the past. But if you want to see the animals, the train is the only way to do so. With the removal of the log flume, the only water ride left is Rattlesnake Rapids. This is an Intamin River Rapids ride placed in the very back of the park. It can be a bit tricky to find because it's the only ride back there. There are so many signs trying to guide you there, but it is worth the hassle. You have a scenic and well landscaped course. You go through a cave at one point and pass some nice rock work. There are plenty of rapids and most give mild splashes, but there are two soakers, one by the tunnel and another at the very end. Then if you ride in summer, there's a giant waterfall that'll get you drenched. You also have a water park known as Laguna Beach. I have not been there because it's only open Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day. It seems to be on the smaller side, but there are some older slides available. You have some body slides and tube slides. While admission to the water park is included, the tube slides are essentially upcharge attractions because you must pay for a $5 tube to use them. Now let's talk about Frightmares. This is a great Halloween event for a regional park. You have five haunted walkthroughs. The park seems to keep the same houses year to year, but they tweak the scenery and you have some variability with the actors. I think Malevolent Mansion and Frightening Frisco have the best set designs. Then Nightwalk and Nightmare Midway have the most effective scares. Now these can get sizable weights because they're included with admission, but the park does offer the Time Warp Skip the Line Pass for $25 to $30. It is only valid in these haunted houses. The best attraction of Frightmares is Seance. This is a unique show. It does cost an extra $15, but it is well worth it if you're into horror. These go fast, 
so make sure to stop by the booth early to reserve your spot. I don't want to spoil what happens, but I'll say the experience is a lot of exposition up front, but the payoff at the end is well worth it. The last thing to note with Frightmares is that it has a lot to offer for kids. Back in Pioneer Village, they have Tree Street with candy and two tamer walkthroughs. So do I recommend Lagoon? Absolutely. This is one of the most underrated parks in America. I think it would get a lot more attention if it was a more frequented state because this really is a park that excels in so many areas. It's scenic and well maintained. The customer service is fantastic between the friendly staff and swift operations. Then the ride lineup is extremely strong too. You have a great headliner coaster and cannibal and plenty of fun supporting coasters. Then the non-coasters are well above average too, especially when you factor in the park's excellent flat ride lineup. This park needs to be on everyone's bucket list. It is such a unique place and you will not be disappointed if you visit. So those are my thoughts on Lagoon in Utah. What are your thoughts on this big amusement park? Do you agree it's a hidden gem as well? Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like and you consider subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster and amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.